title of my reading is The True Meaning of Christmas. Christmas is for giving and for showing that we care, for honoring the Christ child with the loving gifts we share. The wise men gave their riches, the shepherds faith and love. Each gift in its own measure has smiled on, was smiled on from above. Amen. Let every gift be treasured, not always size or price, determines the extent of love and willing sacrifice. Handsome gifts with festive trims bring smiles of sweet content, but modest gifts of humble means are oft times heaven sent. Whether it be large or small, I will share in part. The true meaning of Christmas comes straight from my heart. Amen. Christmas time. Christmas time is finally here. It only comes but once a year. And it's time to spread good cheer to those we love and hold so dear. Amen. Christmas time is a time of glee, a time when peace and love run free, a time for those like you and me to sit beneath the Christmas tree. Christmas time is a time of joy, yes. a time to sit back and enjoy, to smile on each other, girl and boy. Amen. As they play with Christmas toys. Christmas time is a time to share. The passing of another year, birth of Jesus, a joyful prayer, to show loved ones how much we care. Christmas time is a time of song, a time for us to get along, to make us feel Lord Jesus strong, forgiving all those who did us wrong. Mm -hmm. Christmas time is a time to pray. Put love and kindness on display. Show compassion along the way. Christmas time should be every day. Amen. Amen. Amen.
in Advent season. This is the last Sunday of Advent until next Sunday, which is Christmas time. But the last few Sundays, we've been discussing significant births in biblical history that point to the birth of Christ. We spoke about Isaac, and we learned the similarities between Isaac's conception and Jesus' conception. We knew that Abraham and Sarah were barren, and an angel appeared to them and said, you're going to have a child. And we also learned that Joseph and Mary did not have the opportunity to conceive, and therefore both Isaac's conception was miraculous and Jesus' conception was miraculous. We also learned that while Isaac was a promised seed to Abraham, he pointed to the promised seed of Abraham, that being Jesus Christ. Second week, we learned about Moses, who was rescued from murder in order to serve as a deliverer to the Israelites. You had a Pharaoh that did not want to see the growth of the Israelites, and as a result, he made a command to kill all newborn baby boys so that the nation would not grow. However, a deliverer was weaned in his backyard by his own daughter. Amen? And so he was rescued, this deliverer, in the very nation in which he was going to be a victim. In the same way, Jesus was under a edict by Herod, not Jesus himself, but all children under the age of two were to be murdered in order to make sure that the Messiah, the king of the Jews who was prophesied about would not be born. And yet God led them to Egypt in order to hide and be protected from death. God protected a baby so that a baby could be a deliverer. Moses pointed us to Christ. Last week, if you were able to tune in as we were with Lane Tabernacle, Lane Tabernacle last week, we learned about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And he was actually a relative of Jesus because uh, their mothers were relatives. Amen. He was about six months older than Jesus. And we learned that it was prophesied over John that he would be the one calling in the wilderness, make way for the Lord. And G uh, John the Baptist pointed us to Christ, not only by the similarities of his conception and birth, uh, because Zechariah and Elizabeth were also old and barren and could not bear children. So John's conception was miraculous the same way Jesus' conception was miraculous. And he, he also pointed us to Christ in his ministry because he confronted corruption in the government and in the religion in order to be sure that people understood that there was a Messiah coming. Amen. There had been 400 years of silence before John. And so John came in to preach a message of repentance to prepare the nation for the Messiah. John the Baptist pointed us to Christ. But then we also learned about John the Baptist through the words of Jesus himself that John the Baptist was greater than any prophet that came before him. Why? Because the prophets preached that Jesus was coming John the Baptist preached that Jesus was here. Amen. And so he had a greater ministry. But Jesus also said something else. He said that uh, those who are least in the kingdom are greater than John the Baptist. So if the prophets preached that Jesus was coming and John the Baptist preached that Jesus is here, how is it that our ministry is greater than John the Baptist? Well, there's one more thing that is greater than that. If the prophets could say that Jesus was coming and John the Baptist could say that Jesus was here, what are we doing between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus? Our ministry is that Jesus is coming again. 
Amen. And that is how our ministry is greater than that of John the Baptist. And so while Isaac and Moses pointed us to the first coming of Jesus and all the prophets before and, uh, that came after them. And if John the Baptist told us that the Messiah was here, then we've got something to do between then and the next coming of Jesus. We shouldn't be waiting around for something to happen. We shouldn't just be uh, twiddling our thumbs waiting for something to happen. We've got a responsibility between Jesus' ascension and Jesus' return. And that is the act that we are in right now. And we have got to declare that Jesus is coming again. Amen. And so I want to talk about what we're doing now. Because now the responsibility is on us. Abraham and Isaac did what they were supposed to do. Moses did what he was supposed to do. The prophets did what they were supposed to do. John the Baptist did what he was supposed to do. Now we have got to do what we are expected to do. Amen? Amen. So I briefly want to share with you from Isaiah 11, verse 2. Isaiah 11, verse 2. It says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that we have seen and heard today. We thank you, Lord God, for all that you have taught us over the past three weeks about your advent, about your coming, and how everything in biblical history points us to you. So, Lord, as we go into your word today, we ask that you open our ears and our hearts and our minds, Father God, to hear what you would have for us to learn about our responsibility in this advent, in this season, as we look forward to your second coming. Father, I humble myself to nothingness, that you would be everything in me, and that your word would go forth and perform that which you have purposed it to perform, and that it would not return back void. Father, we bless you, we honor you, we glorify you, and we praise you. In Jesus' precious holy name, we say amen, 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 amen. and amen. amen. Here in Isaiah, we are hearing a prophecy about Jesus. We hear him prophesying that there is going to be a branch from the root of Jesse, and he's speaking of Jesus Christ, who comes from the line of David. And he gives some characteristics about Jesus and, and what spirit was going to be upon Jesus. And he tells us that the spirit of wisdom and understanding would be on him. The spirit of counsel and might would be on him and the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And if we read further down, we see how he is going to use the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And it tells us that the Messiah is going to use these characteristics to allow the lion to lay with the lamb and the wolf to lay with the sheep. In other words, characters and people that are polar opposites of each other, animals that would not be able to get along in their natural environment, the spirit of Jesus Christ would bring them together. In other words, the spirit of Jesus Christ would create a spirit of unity. He's not just talking about animals, I just want to let you know. He's talking about us. He's talking about what the Spirit of Christ ought to do in us. So what does it mean to have the spirit of wisdom and understanding? Well, this spirit speaks of the powers of the mind. The powers of the mind. Wisdom discerns the nature of things. Wisdom looks above the black and white and really sees uh, beyond that and understands the nature of how things work. But understanding discerns the difference, right? The wisdom says there's always going to be good, there's always going to be bad, 
right? But understanding says this is good, this is bad, and, th and, and knows the differences in between, right? And, and not only knows it, but deciphers it and lives it according to that distinction. This is the spirit that is on Jesus Christ. Amen. The spirit that is on Jesus Christ is the spirit of counsel and might. This is the spirit of practical activity, right? We've got wisdom and understanding and all of those things can be theoretical, but then we've got to put it into practice, right? It's one thing to know something and the one thing to act, act it out and to live it out. So the counsel is the ability to come to the right conclusion, right? A counsel and might means that after you've used your wisdom and after you've taken that wisdom into understanding and, 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 and made the, 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 the difference between what's right and wrong and good and bad and black and white and up and down, counsel is the ability to come to the right conclusion from all of those things. Counsel is the ability to be able to say, now that I know and understand these things, this is what I have to do with it. And now that I know what I have to do with it, the spirit of might is the ability to carry it out. Amen? So, so we go from the, the wisdom and understanding to the conclusion and now the action. Right? And this is the spirit that is on Jesus Christ. Amen? The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and then the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This is fellowship with God. Amen. Knowledge is not, uh, is not just knowing on the surface. Knowledge is intimacy with God. In, the, in the, the Greek translation, in the Hebrew translation of knowledge, it is intimacy with God. It, when, we, when we hear about Adam knowing Eve, or we hear about Abraham knowing Sarah, or Rebecca knowing Isaac, when we hear about them knowing their spouses, we're talking about an intimate relationship, something that is deeper than just knowing my wife, it's knowing my wife, amen? If, and I, I can pick up on the fact that something's off today, because I know my wife. <laughs> right? I, 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 I've spent enough time with her to know when she's in a good mood or in a not so good mood. I've talked with her long enough to know that something is off today and what can I do to help? That's an intimate relationship. And it's the spirit of the fear of the Lord, the reverent zeal for God. In other words, not that I know about God. But I know God on a relationship level to the point where I am willing to do whatever is necessary to please God. Amen. Because I know what he loves and I know what he hates. Uh, because I know what he wants and I know what he doesn't want. And because I love him enough, I'm going to make sure that I do everything that I can in order to fulfill his desires. The spirit of God puts in me a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. This is the spirit that is on Jesus Christ. This is the spirit that was on that Christ child that we sing about in Silent Night. This is the spirit that is on the Christ child when we sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. This is the spirit. We're not just singing about a baby being born. We're singing about a baby that would be a deliverer. We're singing about a baby that would be a savior because he didn't come to be born. He came to die and that is why we celebrate today. One could not happen without the other. And so we're talking about not just the event of a birth. We're talking about the purpose of a birth. And the characteristics that we are seeing here are what God planned for Jesus Christ long before the earth began. Amen. This is the Christ that Isaac points to. This is the Christ that Moses points to. This is the Christ that the prophets point to. This is the Christ that John the Baptist points to. And this is the Christ that we ought to point to in this season of Advent. And so what are we doing, though, saints? What are we doing with this time? Are we just 
showing up for church so that we can show up the next Sunday? Or are we being carrying the same spirit of the prophets or the same spirit of John the Baptist? Because if they knew that the Messiah had a purpose, then we ought to know that the Messiah had a purpose. And we must do the same as they did. Amen. Have you ever been talking to some Christians and you always hear, oh Lord, it's the end times coming. The Antichrist is coming. The, the, we're seeing signs and, and we're seeing signs going on all around the world that the end is coming. But we're always looking at the negative events that point to the coming of Christ. I read something this morning that blew my mind. He said, what if we stop looking for the Antichrist and spend more time looking for Christ? What if we spend more time looking for what Christ wants to do than what the devil is doing? Amen? Because if we spend more time looking for Christ, then we recognize the Antichrist when he's here. We, we're looking for all of these people that look like an Antichrist, but we need to spend more time looking for Christ and pointing the world to him so that they would not succumb to the Antichrist. So what ought we to do in this time of Advent while we're waiting for this second coming? James 5, 7 through 11 says this, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another. Brethren, lest you be condemned, behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. We have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Two things we have got to do while we're waiting. Number one, be patient. And number two, don't grumble. That's hard to do. Yes, it is. Be patient and don't grumble. We can do one, we can do the other. It's hard to do both, right? If we're being patient, we're probably grumbling in the meantime. Lord, it takes so long. I can't deal with these folks. They get on my nerves. Amen. But the Bible tells us that the coming of the Lord is at hand, and while we are waiting, be patient and don't grumble. And so let me say this to you, in a way, James 5 and 7 through 11 parallels what we read in Isaiah, because it is the vision of a world where, in Isaiah, it's a vision of a world where animals that are natural enemies, wolves and lambs, calves and lions, children and poisonous snakes, they are all living without fear or hatred toward the other. This is what we Christians are pointing to. This is what we should be pointing the world to. This is what we should be preparing the world for. A world where God will overcome the curse of sin and establish a world in which all creatures thrive. If you turn on the news today, do you see that kind of peace? If you turn on CNN right now, how many of you are going to hear somebody say that the Republicans are this and the Democrats are that? If you turn on the news today, you're going to hear somebody say that this side is good and this side is bad. These people are evil. These people are good. All you hear when you turn on the news, even Christians and even churches, are behind their pulpits telling you who is worse than the other when the spirit of wisdom and understanding and the spirit of counsel and might and the spirit of the fear of the Lord is to unite, not to divide. Amen. This is what our forefathers pointed us to and this is what we ought to point the world to. So while we are being patient, waiting for the coming of the Lord, we need to be preaching an outcome that brings about unity and not division. We're not going to like everything that everybody
everybody's doing, but we need to pre preach peace to a world that is bent on division. God is able to accomplish this through the spirit of wisdom and understanding. God is able to accomplish this through the spirit of counsel and might and knowledge and the fear of the Lord because uh, we either cannot or we will not because we have become impatient with one another. Amen. It's hard for you to preach peace to folks when you are not at peace with yourself or the other folks you're around. Amen. Amen. So because we have lost patience with one another, Amen. since we have, don't have that vision of peace that has yet been realized, we turn on one another. We've gotten used to gossip being the norm. We've got used to frustration being the norm. We got used to talking about folks behind their back and smiling in their face as the norm. We've gotten used to that to the point where we don't realize that we are doing the opposite of what the spirit of Christ compels us to do. And so now we're divided socially. We're divided racially and we're divided spiritually. Not even church can get along. The Baptists are mad at the Methodists and the Pentecostals don't get along with the Assemblies of God. And all of these folks are fussing about stuff that ought to be bringing us together than pulling us apart. Amen. So saints, we now, this is what we ought to do. Make the best use of the time that we have. Amen. Have you ever looked at the, have you ever looked at your, your day and said, well, I'm waking up this time. Get up, got to go to work, eight hours at work. I got to run this errand, got to run that errand. Got to take care of this business, got to take care of that business. And you look at that, that small little two hour gap between when you've done everything, when it's time to go to bed. What do you do with that time? Mm -hmm. Amen. What do you do with that time? Some of us, we might binge watch a couple TV shows. Scroll on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok a little bit. We do something to kill that time because we want to rest our brain from all of that mess. But just think, to God, there is no such thing as time. So we don't know when he's coming. So we need to make the best use of the time that we don't know we have. And so in order to do that, we need to make the best use of our time in awaiting the coming of Jesus Christ. That's why the scripture says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Amen. So if you find yourself at a point where you're ready to fuss with somebody, friends, families, co-workers, you're ready to get them told, you're ready to let them have it because you're not going to deal with them no more, just take a minute. Am I making the best use of my time? Because is this pointing to the unity that comes with the spirit of Christ? Amen. You see, we always ready to put up our dukes and defend ourselves when God has said, I've got all of that in control. God is responsible with doing battle for your enemies. God is responsible for fighting against your enemies. You don't have to feel like I'm going to get them told and let them know you can't do me like that. Let God take care of all of that mess for you. And you find a way to make peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we don't know how much time we've got left on this earth. We need to spend it pointing them to Christ instead of pointing them to our own defense. While we are responsible for declaring righteousness and standing up against sin and unrighteousness, we need to be standing up for justice because it is for the purpose of promoting peace and not further creating division. Don't we see enough of that going on in this world? Don't we see enough of don't, don't you just get tired of it? I, I, I know I do. I, get tired. I just shut it off. I shut the news off. I'm sick of everybody yelling at each other, fussing at each other, and we haven't learned a doggone thing. This world has been in existence for millions of years, and everything comes back full circle, and we still realize that folks still will be mad at each other. So why let the Christian be the one that perpetuates the division that the world wants to perpetuate? We need to look different from the world, not like them. 
So God is going to get this right for us. God is going to make sure things are taken care of for us. We don't have to take it upon ourselves to do what God has already promised to do against our enemies. Our responsibility is to be better than John the Baptist. Our responsibility is to be better than the prophets. Our responsibility is to be better than Moses and David. Just like we want our children to be better than us, then Jesus wanted his children to be better than everybody before him. And so our responsibility is to perpetuate the peace that he came to die for. So don't waste valuable time, saints, because Jesus is coming. Don't waste time complaining because Jesus is coming. Don't waste time gossiping because Jesus is coming. Don't waste time politicizing because Jesus is coming. We need to use our time modeling the character of Jesus Christ, Modern, modeling the spirit of wisdom and understanding, modeling the spirit of power and might, modeling the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord because Listen, we might not know when he's coming, but we know that he's coming. And we can't afford to waste our words. We can't afford to waste our relationships. We must advance the kingdom of God, as Jesus said, through compassion and mercy and suffering and patience to point the world to Jesus Christ. So remember, we're not just here celebrating what happened then. We're also celebrating what's going to happen next. Amen. Because Jesus is coming yes, yes. again. Amen. 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 Let us stand.